والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي، اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا ولا بيننا شقيا ولا محروما. إنك ولي ذلك والقادر عليه، اللهم صل على صفي المرسلين، اللهم صل على شفيع المرسلين، اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على شفيع المرسلين، أما بعد. Tonight's topic is about a journey that we all are about to embark on, and that is a journey that everyone has consensus on, the believer and the disbeliever, the righteous and the corrupt, the old and the young. This journey is the end, which marks the end of this journey that we undergone, and certain physiological, physical, spiritual aspects of this journey come to an end to mark the end of this journey and the beginning of another one. Now, much of what's beyond this journey we've been told about by way of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So much of the evidence that we're going to present today is based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the Qur'an being the final revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one and the only one divine revelation in existence. And so is the Sunnah, the way of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the statements and the information that the Prophet has given us, which in no form or shape reflects his opinion, but it reflects a direct inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one and the only deity that is rightfully worshipped. The Prophet has lived up until he was 63 years old, and in his final moments, as he was undergoing, the physiological and physical changes of one who is being separated from this world, moving on to another world, he makes a statement to the effect, Ala inna lil mawti sakarat. And this statement is a very precise description of the experience that we all shall undergo as we approach these final moments and as we undergo that same experience that the Prophet has undergone. The word sakirat is the plural of sakira. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَاءَتْ سَكِرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ ذَلِكَ مَا كُنْتَ مِنْهُ تَحِيلٌ The state of drunkenness has come to you according to the truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that every nafs, every soul shall perish. Everyone, everyone shall part ways with this dunya. There is an interesting similarities between a state of drunkenness, somebody who's been intoxicated, and someone who's undergoing sakarat al maut the state of intoxication of death, if you will. Physiologically speaking, one has been proven that one is in, who is in, uh, intoxicated, they tend to have a short breath. They tend to have a short memory. Their breathing begins to slow down. Their heartbeats begin to slow down. They become disoriented. To the extent, depending on how much they drank, they could actually pass out and then come back again, wake up, and then pass out, and so on and so forth. They could actually, if they drank enough, they could pass away altogether. Similarly, one who's undergoing these states of drunkenness, of death, as the soul begins to part ways with the body, and this is by definition, uh, you know, the, the, the definition of death uh, in Islamic, from an Islamic perspective, is that it's the separation of the soul from the body. So it doesn't matter if the body is old or young, healthy or unhealthy, whatever the case might be. There's a process through which the soul begins to part ways with the body. And this is clearly and meticulously described in the Sunnah, where the Prophet ﷺ describes to us how the soul part ways with the body. Now, as far as the innate nature of the soul, when a group of the Israelites came to the Prophet ﷺ to ask him about the soul, they said, they said, أخبرنا عن الروح. So the Prophet ﷺ said, come back to me and I will tell you about the soul later. He was waiting for the Archangel Gabriel, who is the messenger from the heavens to all the prophets and the messengers, peace be unto them. He was waiting for him to come and tell, uh, give the answers to these questions. So Gabriel, peace be unto him, came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, in the Quran, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنُ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمِّ رَبِّ وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا They ask you about the soul, say that the soul is of the knowledge that is solely privy to my Lord, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and we have not given you from knowledge except very little. So in no form or shape, any of us, since the coming of the Prophet well over 1400 years ago, up until now, no one has ever discovered anything new about the soul. Nobody knows anything about the soul, and no one will ever discover or know anything about the soul. But there are certain physiological and physical uh, you know, events that take place that tells us that this person is in an active state of dying. And these physical and physiological changes, we notice that those who have been around, people who undergo in this process, that the first thing the soul part ways with is the feet. So the soul begins to part ways with the feet, and then the legs. So this person now begins to lose temperature in the feet and in the legs, and then it begins to emerge upward. At that moment, the Prophet ﷺ tells us in the hadith, when one is about to part ways with this life, that the angel of death comes and he sits next to his head or her head. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that at that moment, the soul begins to reach the collarbone. And for those who are agonizing with the soul, we begin to hear sounds for them. And this is usually not a good sign that this person is really dying, you know, not on a bad, not on a good ending. Because the Prophet ﷺ describes for us, you know, the soul of the believer has parts ways with the body. It's like a drop of dough slipping off of a leaf. You know, in the morning, in the early morning hours, when you see this little moisture, the dough, on top of the leaves, and has slipped so slowly, so gently, so does the soul of the believer as it emerges from the body, the angel of death takes it so slowly that there's hardly any pain or any agony. The opposite is, of course, with the disbeliever or the corrupt. When the angel of death comes and the veil, meaning that the veil of that which is beyond that which we can see, the veil of al-ghayb, the unknown, a different world, is uncovered to this individual and they see that their soul and their body shall perpetuate for eternity in the hellfire, ayyadah billah, the soul scatters throughout the body. So the angel of death begins to yank it out with much agony to the one who was actively undergoing this death process. So we have two opposite ends. You know, one is the slow departure of the soul from the body of the believer in a very slow and gentle way. And the other one is a harsh departure of the body as scatters throughout, of the soul as scatters throughout the body, of the disbeliever as it emerges. And of course, there's a meticulous description, and I don't want to go too much into details. But who awaits this soul? If it's a believer, those who await the soul are the angels of mercy for as far as the eyesight can see. And the moment the angel of death takes this soul away from you know, the believer, the angels of mercy, they descend with the shroud and with the incense and the beautiful sense that they're about to wrap up the soul and take it away from the angel of death. And they would ascend to the heavens with it. And the gates of the heavens will open up for the soul. And then, of course, every time it passes by a group of angels, they would say, what a beautiful soul. What a beautiful scent. Who does this soul belong to? Then this person is being you know, told that this is the soul of this person, or the angels are being told that this is the soul of this person. And the most beautiful names are used for this person. Then the soul descends to the grave of this individual that, has been, that his body has been buried there. Now, of course, the... Munkar and Nakir, uh, 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 Nakir, they come to this individual and they sit him up. Of course, one could wonder how could one be, you know, sitting up in a grave where there's so much soul and whatever. Again, this is information that has been told to us by way of divine revelation from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, by way of divine inspiration of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's authentic information based on the fact that the Quran is entirely is authentic, in its entirety is divine. And so is the Sunnah. So now Munkar and Nakir, they set up this person and they ask him the three questions. Who is your Lord? And what is your religion? And, and what do you say about this man who was sent for you? So a believer will answer successfully, my Lord is Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one and the only one that is rightfully worshipped. My religion is Islam. It's the religion of Adam, it's the religion of Noah, the religion of, the religion of Musa and the religion of Moses, the religion of Jesus, the religion of Muhammad, peace be unto them all, because the religion of submission from the same deity, from the same God, 
to different messengers delivering the same message that there is none worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that all these respective prophets are ought to be obeyed as they were sent to be obeyed with the, with the, with the guidance. So as this person answers successfully to these three questions, then the grave is extended as far as the eyesight can see and it's turned now into an oasis of paradise. It's turned now into an oasis from paradise. And now, a person comes to visit this deceased. And then the believer will ask, who are you? By Allah, you are the one who has a face that's delivering good news. And you have a scent that is such a beautiful scent. Who are you? He said, I am your deeds. And I'm here to keep you company until the hour. Until the day of resurrection. Now the complete opposite happens to the disbeliever or to the corrupt. As the soul part ways with the body and the angels of punishment come to this individual and they take this soul away from the angel of death and they ascend with it to the heavens and the gates of heavens are shut, closed. It's not open for this individual. So the soul now is turned down into the grave. And as Munkar and Nakir come to question this individual, asking him the same three questions that each and every one of us will be asked. Who is your Lord? And what is your religion? And what do you say about the man who was sent for you? So the person would say, Ha ha, I don't know. I heard. I heard. So he'll be told, لا علمت ولا دريت. أو كما ورد في الحديث as the Prophet ﷺ tells us. So this person now is squeezed by his own grave to the extent that his body limbs are not unidentifiable. You cannot identify the body limbs. You know that gets so mixed up by the squeeze that everyone in the heavens and the earth will hear the screams of this individual, God forbid, except the human beings, except the thaqalim, the human beings and the world of jinn. And then of course, this person now is being visited by this other individual who comes to him with a face that is delivering bad news. And this Disease will say, who are you? By Allah, you are the one who's got a face, who has a face that is delivering, that's the face of a person who's delivering bad news. And you have such a stinking smell. He said, I am your deeds. And I'm here to keep you company until the hour, until judgment day. Now it's interesting, we perceive everything around us to be inanimate. You know, has no language, cannot speak, doesn't have a tongue and a mouth like we do. But the moment a person lands into his grave, the grave itself will speak. To the believer, he said, By Allah, you are among the most beloved people to me. And I was anxiously awaiting you to come here. And now that I have you, I will show you the taste of pleasure. And I will take good care of you. Imagine this, the grave speaking to the believer. And the opposite is to the disbeliever or to the corrupt. He would say, by Allah, you are walking above me, and you are among the most despicable people to me. And now that I get a hold of you, I will show you what I will do with you. And of course, everything in the creation has the pledge of allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the good news for the believers at the moment of the soul parting ways with the body, where the angels descend upon this individual. Now to us, a person who is going through this active process of dying, it may sound like they are in a state of hallucination. You know, we don't know what they're saying. You know, the, you know. But in reality, they are seeing things that we can't see. Why? Because now the soul is part in ways with the body, the veil is uncovered. So they're seeing things that we cannot see. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تَوْعَدُونَ نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ That those who declare the shahada, saying, أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله and they affirm this testimony of none is worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala none is rightfully worshipped but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator of the heavens and the earth and none is worthy of following except his prophet Muhammad 
that at the moment of nazza, when the soul is parting ways with the body, and this is the most critical moment in anybody's life, because this marks the beginning of the first journey into the second journey, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so there's another visit after the visit of this world we are visiting the graves meaning that these are all short durations and when the hour comes that will be the eternal life that will be the long duration until you visited the graves so those who declare the shahada the tanazzal is an exaggerated form of dissension. Means that the angels will descend in huge numbers. Allah takhafu wa la tahzan. Do not fear and do not be sad. Typically, do not fear that which is yet to come. Because a person who is about to embark on a new journey, they are in a state of apprehension. They don't know what to expect. But here, the news in this critical moment comes to them is that do not fear and do not be sad. Do not be saddened over that which you've left behind. Could be young children, could be family members, could be those who you are taking care of. It could be anything. It means that you have nothing. It could be just missed opportunities. That we all wanted to do something, we never got around to it. it could be just a missed opportunity. لا تحزنوا, do not be saddened over this. This is all a thing of the past now. Something that has perished. Now you're about to embark on a new journey, a new life, a new experience altogether. We are your protectors, we were your protectors in this worldly life until the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come. So the protectors from among the angels, when the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, that this is the end of this individual's life, and nobody knows that until that final moment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees that this is the final moment of this individual's time for them to part ways with this life. Have look forward to a paradise, the width of which is the heavens of the earth, where an eye is never seen, and ears ever heard, or even the imagination of a human being ever reached. We are protectors in this worldly life. will also be your protectors in the hereafter. We'll intercede on your behalf. You'll be eligible for the intercession of the Prophet. And that marks the end of the second journey when the trumpet is blown and everyone, the second trumpet that is, the first one, when it's blown, everyone in the heavens on earth perishes. Everyone ceases to exist. No one is in existence at all except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where it was mentioned in a long hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the angel of death to capture the soul of all of the angels. And then he will come back and report to the one who knows it all. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he will say, oh Allah, none is left but you, Jibreel, Gabriel alayhi salam, and myself. <coughs> and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him to take the soul of Jibreel alayhi salam. So then the angel will say, oh Allah, Jibreel, say yes. He will take the soul of Jibreel alayhi salam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command him to take his own soul. To take his own soul. And he would take his own soul, and as he's in a state of nazar, an active process of dying, he would say, had I known how bitter this experience is, I would not have taken the soul of any believer. Of course, not an act of defiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but an act of empathizing with the believers as the soul part ways with the body. And then everything will be perished for a period of 40 years, and none will be exist in existence except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the king of all, will say, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ But there's no one to answer. To who belong kingship today? To who belong the throne? To whom belong the, king, the dominion of the heavens and the earth? But no one, is, no one is in existence to answer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask that question again. لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ No one answers. لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ He would answer himself, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَارِ لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَارِ To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one and the only one, Al-Qahar, the one who is able over all. The one whose will is a, you know, supersedes all. The one whose might and power supersedes all. And that's why some of the scholars said, you know, Al-Ismu Al-A'zam Lillah is an ishtihad, Allah Ta'ala A'lam. Al-Ismu Al-A'zam, Al-Ladhi Idha Du'iya Bihillahu Istijab, Al-Wahid Al-Qahar. This is an opinion. 
that this is the one that this is the greater or the greatest name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. Again, this is one opinion, there are other opinions. Now, the second trumpet is blown. And everybody is walking towards Ard al Mahshar. Ard al Mahshar is the land of resurrection, which is on this earth. But it's not going to be the earth that we know now, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتُ وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَارِ When the heavens are changed, and the earth is changed, and all you see is, لَا عِوَجًا وَلَا أَمْتَى You will not see any ups and downs, no mountains, no valleys, everything just perfectly leveled. Everything is perfectly white. In other words, you can look in the distance and you will see nothing but an open field. And it's an earth that is ready to receive everyone who emerges from, you know, their graves. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the earth to open up and all these graves will open up and everyone will emerge and everyone will begin walking towards Ard al-Mahshar, the land of resurrection. Some will be walking, some will be riding, some will be a short journey, some will be a long journey, but everyone knows their destination. No one will speak except those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives permission to. And you will only hear whispers. People are just whispering to one another. And everyone in a state of apprehension, a state of fear, except those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guaranteed for them that on judgment day that they will be resurrected in a state of safety and security. They will be shaded in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among the different types of the believers, those who loved one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who upheld the Quran, those who upheld the, their covenants to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who spent, you know, uh, you know, with, with the right so the left doesn't know, you know, where the money went, you know, fi sabirillah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that moment, no one will speak and Muhammad sallallahu as people go, to the different prophets, to Adam, and to Nuh, and to Musa, and to Isa, and so on, they will ask for intercession. And everyone will say, no, it's not for me, it's not for me, it's not for me. They will come to the Prophet ﷺ, and he will prostrate himself under the Arsh, the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach him supplications that he did not know before. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the gates of dua for him. He begins to supplicate with these ad'iyah, these supplications that he did not know before. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell him, raise your head, washfa' to shafa'. Raise your head and ask for intercession and you shall be granted. And of course, only certain people will be eligible for this shafa'ah as we also learn from the Quran and the Sunnah. Now, the day of reckoning takes place as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes, uh, describes for us in the Quran. In Surah Al-Sajdah, He says, إِنَّ يَوْمًا عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ كَالْفِ سَنَةٍ مِمَّا تَعْلُونَ Yawm is a time period. In the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one day is like 1,000 years for what we count. In other words, my lifespan and yours does not even qualify to be considered one day in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On Judgment Day, Judgment Day is 50,000 years. 50,000 years. And everyone shall receive their meticulous reckoning. Just to get an idea of how some of our scholars understood the Day of Reckoning. Sa'id ibn Jubayr, when he was tried and tested by Al-Hajjaj. Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi was known to be the murderer. And before he sentenced him to death, he wanted to, he couldn't have his way with him. He could not influence him in any way. So he brought a musical instrument and he brought some treasures and jewelry and gold and silver and he put it between the hands of Sa'id ibn Jubayr and tries to capitalize or trying to instigate his emotions. So Sa'id ibn Jubayr laughed. So Hajjaj said, oh, I got through to you with the music and the treasures and this and that. He said, no. He said, by Allah, I'm just amazed how arrogant you are and how unjust you are and how patient Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. He said, as for the treasures that you brought, if it's fi sabirillah, then it's a good investment. But if it's fi sabir dunya for this dunya, for this perishable, then it's going to be against you on judgment day. And then he said, as far as the musical instruments, which has been made from what? Wood and the intestines of a sheep. Look how, look how uh, you know, uh, piercing 
of an insight he has into the reckoning and the meticulous reckoning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has on judgment day. He said, as for the musical instrument, shajaratun quti'at bighayri haq. It's a tree that was cut without just cause to make this forbidden instrument. And as for the intestines of the sheep that these strings were made of, these musical strings, it will come on judgment day asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for justice from you. So we can see sometimes we do things we don't give much thought to, or we just say, oh, something silly, so something not worth paying attention to. This man, as he's facing his death, he's thinking about how meticulous the reckoning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, and he's bringing this to the attention of Al-Hajjaj. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reckons between everyone. And every act of injustice shall be rectified on judgment day. And everyone who has a hasana, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not deprive him from that. A hasana, as we know, is a unit of reward for good deeds. And a sayya is a unit of reward for bad deeds, for those who've done, you know, bad deeds. So as you do, you shall find. As for the disbelievers, they're taken into the hellfire and shall, they shall perpetuate there, you know, forever. And as for the believers, they go to paradise as they cross the Sirat. And the Sirat is described to us as uh, something above, it's like a bridge, if you will, above the hellfire. It's thinner than a hair and it's sharper than a sword. And according to each one's level of Iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant them the light and the speed to cross this Salat safely. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who cross it safely. Allahumma amin. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as He reckoned between everyone, He will call onto the people, onto the people of paradise. Of course now, everybody's in a state of apprehension while we're being called. And then He will call onto the people of the hellfire, and they think that they may have hope of exit in the hellfire. And then He will bring death, which at that point we all have seen it, and to be represented in the form of a sheep. And it's brought, uh, it's brought upon the Sirat. And he would say, Ya Ahl al-Jannah, Wa Ya Ahl al all people of paradise, or the dwellers of the hellfire. And they would all answer, and they say, Do you know who this is? And they would say, Yes, this is death. Then this sheep is slaughtered upon the Sirat. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say, Ya Ahl al-Jannah, Khuludun bila maut, all people of paradise, you shall perpetuate in paradise for eternity, and there is no death. وَيَا أَهْلَ النَّارِ خُلُودٍ بِلَا مَوْتٍ You shall perpetuate, all people of the hellfire shall perpetuate in there for eternity without the hope of leaving without death. This is what's been told to us in general in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah about the end of this journey and then the beginning of another one which is a mere parting ways with the loved ones and the familiar places that we know here on earth into another paradise. So death to us as Muslims has been defined from a Qur'an and, 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 a, and a hadith perspective is simply a separation, parting ways as we leave in one country into another. But here we leave in one life into another. We leave in, you know, one familiar place into a place that we are yet to be familiar with. And we, of course, separate between, you know, family members. So and everyone, of course, shall go through this journey. However, one who is successful, and success is measured by how obedient we were to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how sincere we were in rendering the deeds, how close we were to applying the sunnah of the Prophet how well we understood the Qur'an, and how well we lived and died by it, lived and died by the Qur'an. At that moment, one who descends into the grave among the believers will supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah, hasten the hour so I can go back to my home, home in paradise. And at that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us by way of the Prophet that would be more familiar, we would be more familiar with our homes in paradise than the homes we live in, we live in, in this dunya. And of course, the opposite is for the disbeliever. In spite of the agony and the misery that they live with, you know, in their grave, they would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to delay the hour because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْعَذَابُ الْآخِرَةِ أَشَدُّ وَأَبْقَى That the punishment of the hereafter is more intense, it's more severe and more lasting. So they want to settle with that which is less intense and 
not as lasting. It's a fairly long journey, but not as perpetual as the journey of the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us so about the people of the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh and his people. That they are taken to show to be shown their places in the hellfire. Mornings and evenings. Mornings and evenings to remind them that this is your eternal place in the hellfire. And when the hour comes, cause the people of the Pharaoh to enter the severest of punishment, and that is an eternal life or the lack of it in the hellfire and that life has been in meticulous details described in the Quran and just in the interest of time I'm just touching upon certain aspects of it so to us as Muslims you know it's a journey that we're about to embark on we don't know when it could be in the next few minutes or less it could be in the next few months it could be in the next few years but something that everyone has a consensus over is the fact that we all must undergo this journey I will conclude with this hadith where the Prophet ﷺ tells us أَكْثِرُ مِنْ كِثْرِ هَادِ مِنْ And another narration, هَادِ مِنْ Remember frequently هَادِ مِنْ The destroyer of whims and desires. And another narration, هَادِ مِنْ Meaning that the defeater of whims and desires. Whatever it is we desire for, once we remember death, this is certainly is a deterrent for us you know, to pursue these unlawful whims and the desires. Now, some of us may be pessimistic about death and dying, but that should not be the case. To the contrary, remembering that is the right recipe for the heart, the heart to be righteous. For us, it's like a motivation. So we should use it as a positive energy to continue on that straight path to do what we're supposed to be doing. It should be a positive energy that we are coming to an end of a low life, if you will, the low form of life, into emerging into a higher form of life, we will be able to see the angels. We will be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, our sustainer, our cherisher. So it's really, it's a, it's a positive, we ought to use it as a positive energy. We ought to hasten towards doing righteous deeds, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا and hasten towards the paradise. In other words, do not harbor on this one. Do not dwell on this one. What's yet to come is a lot better. And don't let this one drag you down. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, dunya illa That the life of this dunya, dunya from dana, to come you know, low, if you will. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form of life that is very physical in nature. And it takes a lot of spiritual motivation to propel you forward to the life that is yet to come. وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا كَعَرْضِ السَّمَاوَاتِ And a paradise, the width of which is the heavens and the earth. So imagine the link. Just uh, one uh, brief description of a tent that a believer will own in paradise. A tent, the width of which is 60 miles, and is carved from a pearl. Can you imagine a tent that is carved from a pearl? If you look at the pearls of this dunya, the largest of which is what? About an inch diameter, an inch and a half, maybe two. But this is like a peril that has been carved into a tent, and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's inside this tent. But we know that the shell of this tent is a pearl. We know the width of which is 60 miles. 60 miles. How about the length? Allah ta'ala ala wa We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who are the dwellers of paradise. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who he is pleased with in this dunya and the hereafter, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who are granted a happy ending, a successful ending, and a successful resurrection. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to join us with the prophets, the messengers, the martyr, the righteous, those who uh, spent their life fi sabirillah, and those who died fi sabirillah, and those who are resurrected under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله واستغفره سبحانك والحمد لله نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته